Press is nationwide on the network service of the NTA. Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Hawa Salihu Adama. We begin with the health sector. There is growing concern over the rising cases of Lassa fever in parts of the country. This becomes more worrisome going by available data which shows there are currently 292 suspected cases across the country. This is against 172 cases, suspected cases recorded in 2019. Records also show that while there were 60 confirmed cases in 2019, 64 cases have so far been confirmed as positive Lassa fever cases since January this year. There are a total of 121 reported cases across the country, with Ondo State having the largest number of cases. For more on the Lassa fever outbreak, I have joining me live now Bukola Aduo from Akure, Obehi Otobo Apresi in Benin, and Muhammad Rabiu Ali in Kanu. Thank you all for joining me. But before we start our conversation, I'd like for you to see the response of the Director General of the National Center for Disease Control, Dr. Chikwe Ihekwazu. Over the past few years, uh, we, you know, we've had a lot of Lassa fever cases, specifically uh, the la highest incident have been in three states, Ondo, Edo, and the Boeing states. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm particularly proud of the work done in Ondo. Mm -hmm. If you go to FMC or one now, you know, we've really collaborated with the state government mm -hmm. in, in Ondo state and worked to develop a center that has the expertise. They have a new, brand new molecular lab mm -hmm. uh, so that the tests can be done in that ma ma facility preventing, uh, you know, reducing the time to treatment. And now we already have a team in Kano supporting the Amino Kano Teaching Hospital and we're working with the state team. We've provided prophylaxis for all the healthcare workers and try to reassure them and reduce the anxiety. But the, the key thing about that Kano thing is mm -hmm. it's uh, something we have to all learn. We have a medical center situated at the And this facility is saddled with responsibilities of handling cases like this. So far, patients and admission have been managed since the outbreak in the state. Sadly, we have recorded 16 deaths. And the hospital management confirmed that the centre is equipped with essential drugs and qualified medical personnel. I would say that the situation is under control. It is also interesting to know that there is a special lab laboratory in the hospital where tests are run and the Lassa virus is detected. I would say the response so far is positive and um, encouraging. Okay, that's good news, um, Bukola. I'll put you on pause now and go to Obehi in Benin. Obehi, please, could you confirm the existence of Lasso fever cases in Edo State this time around? Oh, uh, yes, thank you for coming to Benin. I can confirm that 175 cases have been recorded in Benin in this recent, in Edo, in this recent outbreak with eight deaths recorded. Ten local government councils in the state are affected by are, are prevalent in this um, current outbreak. Um, this was disclosed by the state deputy governor after a tripartite meeting with um, key players in the health sector, including representatives of the World Health Organization. Um, the deputy governor has also um, given much in order for the situation to be taken as high priority. Thank you, Obehi. We now go to northern Nigeria, where we have um, Mohammed Rabiu Ali. Mohammed, beside the recorded death, what is the number of confirmed cases at the Aminu Kano Teaching Hospital? Uh, thank you, Hawa. Uh, for now, uh, the available uh, uh, information gathered uh, from the Aminu Kano Teaching Hospital uh, there is no single uh, case of uh, Lassa fever, uh, apart from the uh, ones that uh, uh, claim the lives of uh, two doctors and uh, a patient. And uh, it is pertinent to know that uh, uh, one of the doctors uh, who uh, took part uh, uh, during the caesarean operation, uh, the surviving doctor, uh, is now uh, receiving treatment uh, so far at the Malam Aminu Kano uh, 
uh, teaching hospital. Uh, so far, so good. Uh, the activities have fully resumed, uh, unlike uh, uh, the four, uh, last four days, uh, where people are uh, panic and also uh, afraid to uh, go to the hospital. So the management of uh, Amini Kanuti Hospital have called on people to remain calm and uh, uh, continue to uh, do their normal businesses as uh, the killer disease uh, is now contained. Thank you for the reassurance from Kanu. Let's rejoin Bukola in Undo, Akure to be specific. Uh, Bukola, I'm just wondering, I said apparently there are inputs from the federal level in terms of response. Can you lay out how realistic these assistance are and how it has boosted morale amongst personnel at the Center for Disease Control? Yes, we, we should not forget that the Federal Medical Center here in Kowok is a federal government facility and is one of the centers for the treatment and management of Lassa fever in Nigeria. That means the presence of the federal government is felt here. The federal government, through the Nigeria Center for Disease Control, that's the NCDC, has been providing technical support to the outbreak of the disease because um, officials of the agency are collaborating with the local government to vaccinate the people in various towns communities and villages, you know, especially in the area of hygiene. NCDC is also providing drugs, both consumables and non-consumables. Patients currently down and receiving treatment at the FMC or more. We know that um, our investigation has shown to us that the cost of uh, treatment, lack of fever, is huge, but the federal government is giving them free, free of charge. So I think this is commendable and we can say that the presence of the federal government itself here in the state. Yeah, government seems to be on top of the situation, both at the federal and state level there, Bukola. I'll put you on hold and go to Obehi again in Benin. Obehi, what is the structure in place in Edo State for monitoring and response for diseases like Lassa fever? The deputy governor has um, given directive that um, three ambulances should be released to the three Lassa fever centers in Edo State with strict instruction that these ambulances be used only for Lassa fever cases. Um, he has also directed that agencies should strengthen their advocacy and sensitization policies with a view to curbing this um, spread of this disease. Okay, Obey, I would join uh, Mohammed Rabiu Ali again in Kanu. Mohammed, I'm just wondering, considering the nature of Kanu, you know, being uh, kind of a cosmopolitan city, but you still have amorphous communities around, what is the, what, how is the issue of uh, preventive care being raised by the local authorities? Well, as you said, Kano is a cosmopolitan uh, a city where, you know, uh, there is influx of people uh, from uh, across the country. Uh, so far, apart from the measures taken by the Aminu Kano Teaching Hospital, uh, Kano State Ministry of uh, Health have also uh, put uh, in place uh, measures, uh, you know, to contain this disease. Uh, there are 300 uh, people suspected uh, uh, to be infected with this killer disease. Uh, currently, they are now uh, under quarantine uh, to you know, uh, look after them uh, so that uh, the disease uh, is not spread uh, across the, the state. So the state government is doing all it can uh, to ensure that uh, the uh, disease is contained uh, through sensitization, distribution of drugs, uh, and what have you. So they are doing uh, all it can to uh, make sure that the disease is contained uh, and uh, it does not spread out of uh, uh, the state. Okay, that's good. And then in Akure, Buki, are you with me? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Could you tell us more about um, awareness and uh, on good hygiene, especially amongst um, uh, the communities in the state? government is mm. actually taking steps to control the spread of lack of fever in the state because um, the government is collaborating with media with the media 
So, and I've come up with jingles, both in English and indigenous languages, as the way of educating the people and Africa about the spread of lack of fever in their communities. Also, the state government has um, redoubled its effort on proper waste disposal advocacy just to improve the sanitary conditions of the environment. These are just some of the interventions of the state government as far as lack of fever is concerned in London. Okay. Thank you very much, Buki. I think that will be all for now. We truly appreciate your contribution today. You're welcome, Allah. Right for now. And Obehi in Benin and Mohammed Rabiu Ali, that would also be all for now. Thank you very much. Still on health matters, it is estimated that at least 12 Nigerian doctors leave the shores of the country weekly in search of greener pastures. This is the unfortunate reality confronting the nation's health sector. What are the factors driving this trend and what is the way forward? Neka Oko is here with some answers. One major factor that continues to affect the human resource development of Nigeria is the brain drain syndrome. As many Nigerian professionals in different fields, especially health, almost on a daily basis leave the shores of Nigeria in search of better work conditions abroad. Figures released by the British government indicate that Nigerian medics constitute 3.9 percent of the 137,000 foreign staff of 202 nationalities working alongside British doctors and nurses while no fewer than 5,405 Nigeria-trained doctors and nurses currently work with the National Health Services in the United Kingdom. These development health experts observe has not only contributed to shortage of skilled and experienced health professionals, but worsened the physician-patient ratio in the country from what it used to be to one doctor to 5,000 patients as against World Health Organization's recommendation of one doctor to 600 patients. We have so many reasons that are attributable. One, many states and federal government are not employing adequate number of health officers. Those who are employed, many of them are overstretched. And again, the working environment, sometimes you don't have the equipment you needed. Now a doctor comes out of medical school expecting, you know, to get opportunities and all that. Those opportunities don't exist. Nigerian health professionals abroad are urged to demonstrate their patriotism for the country by returning home to contribute their quota to national development. In Abakaliki, Neka Uku, NTA News. And it's nationwide on the network service of the NTA. Time for a break. Up ahead, the scramble for Africa by Asia and Europe. Details when we return. Do stay. Thanks for rejoining us. Moving on, the first UK-Africa Investment Summit has come and gone. It was aimed at fostering mutually beneficial partnership with Africa that is intended to move Africa forward by attracting quality investment to drive the growth. What is responsible for this new trend of investment in Africa? Amina Nujim tells us more. A gathering, you would say, of African countries selling their potential to the United Kingdom, whose sole aim is to become G7's largest investor in Africa by 2022 in the wake of Brexit. Following global trends, the United Kingdom is not the first country to try to woo renewed partnership with Africa. China, Japan, and Russia readily come to mind. With these meetings promising better deals for Africa viewed as the most untapped region on the globe, some school of thought believe it's not so far away from the 18th century scramble for Africa by European powers playing out in the 20th century. But this time around, with both sides negotiating and Africa by gaining from a point of advantage. A closer look at recent figures show that Africa's two-way trade with China, for instance, the continent's top trading partner, was put at $208 billion in 2019. Africa, with a population of over 1.3 billion people, is equivalent to about 16.72% of world's population, making it one of the most populous continents of the world. 
The UK is anticipating $7.6 billion worth of investment after the major investment summit in London. In the meantime, Africa looks forward to promises of alleviating poverty, improved living conditions, better trade deals and renewable energy, among others. Thanks, Amina. And joining me now in the studio to talk about, to talk more on the recent global investment bid in Africa is an economist, Yushio Aliu. Thanks for coming on Nationwide. Thank you very much. Good. Okay. Recently, we've had the China-Africa, Japan-Africa, Russia-Africa, and now UK-Africa Investment Summit. What, in your opinion, is responsible for this? It's, it's crumbling for businesses. That is what is just taking place. You know, uh, you just have to have friends. And when you have friends, regionally, you have to have friends con uh, continentally. And it's not just that. One, one important aspect of it is that most of these economies that have advanced to this uh, mass consumption stage uh, have opened their borders and invited more friends. So you only have more friends, you have better market, you have better opportunities, and then you have better investment opportunities. And that is why uh, in recent times, uh, even colonizers, they, they find out that the best way to deal with colonies, former colonies, is to engage them in trade, is to engage them in technology, is to engage them in trying to distribute jobs among them. Because some of the trend that is taking place, especially in the Europe, is that they want to contain the number of Africans migrating so that they can have better uh, opportunities within them. But in doing that, uh, the, the continent, for instance, Africa, is deficient. It has so much of deficit, deficit in infrastructures, and that is why many are looking at that going by going there is a, is a big opportunity but they now contend that the best way to do it is to organize the world market when you organize the world market you have a standard policies on ground and that is why the uk africa they are talking of lasting relationship you know when lasting relationship is measured it's not going to be temporal it's, it's going to have short-term benefit and at the same time will have a long-run benefit to mutually okay better economic opportunities no doubt but there are speculation this perhaps may result to an economic partitioning of Africa. Uh, there is nothing wrong because we are living in, a, in an age that you must be smart. The type of market that is operating is hit around. So Africa has better opportunity now because they are the ones, everybody is targeting Africa. And when they are targeting Africa, they are targeting Sub-Saharan Africa. And in Sub-Saharan Africa, they are targeting Nigeria. Why? Because our consumption pattern and the resources available, and at the same time, our future is assured. So nobody is doubting this. Most mm -hmm. of the economists, including Jim, Jim O'Neill, who that prophesied that Africa is going to take over in the next 10 years, 10 to 20 years, Africa will take over whatever that is going to happen in the world in the field of trade. And that is why Africans today, from the report of the NTA, you now see how doctors, 12 doctors migrating, migrating to where? To only UK. Meaning that we have the capacity by the time we settle and we fix the, in, uh, the deficit in our infrastructures, then people will begin to have medical tourism in Africa because we have the capacity. The only thing is just to have the right investors and in, in making friends. You have to make sure that you are making good friends. Okay, to take over, how should we prepare for other investment opportunities? Uh, by looking at the windows. Any opportunity has a window. Mm. The window is technology. When you don't have technology, we are all operating digital economy. Mm. Russia has gone far in digital economy. China has gone far in digital economy. Nigeria is moving. But you have to now look at our laws. And that is why this finance bill that was changed, that was looked into with amendment, is going to help investors to come, is going to help the economy in the short run, and will help the economy in the long run. And we also have to check our deficiencies. Deficiencies that we are coming out of recession, especially in Nigeria. Mm. It means that we have to devise means at which most of our resources that is going to uh, change the, 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 the status quo of our investment is being uh, uh, clearly identified and targeted. Yeah, yeah. That will be all for now. Thank you very much. Thank you very Ms. much. Marlon, Yushu, and Liu. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. And Hingino in our Lagos Network Center is next on Nationwide. Hello, you're on. Thank you, Hawa, for joining us in Lagos. 
In furtherance of its commitment to providing a level playing ground for all stakeholders in the delivery of credible elections in the country, the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, has reiterated its ambition to recognizing all categories of persons in achieving this through data capturing. This was at a one-day strategy meeting on capturing of disaggregated data of persons with disabilities across the country held in Lagos. Twinde Saiki has more. The United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons Living with Disabilities has been the guiding standard in disability inclusion the world over. So far, 162 countries have signed the convention. The Article 29 of the treaty focuses on participation in political and public life. It calls on states to ensure that persons with disabilities can effectively and fully participate in political activities on equal basis with others and granted the opportunity to vote and be voted for. The, um Kogia election, Bayelsa election, we provided for all polling units. Whereas it was unnecessary to do that. But because we did not have the data to assist us in providing for areas where those things are needed. Sustained statistics of persons with disabilities engagement in the electoral process in Nigeria. Some participants at the meeting noted that such strategy will not only assist INEC and persons with disabilities in the electoral process, but also help in reducing waste and human and material resources. You, you could never ask for much more than that in the area of inclusivity. We cannot have an inclusive, free and fair elections without knowing the numbers of those to either vote or to be elected. The one-day strategy meeting had in attendance officials of INEC and other stakeholders from across the country. In Lagos, Tunde Saiki, NTA News. Now, Lagosians who use water transportation can now breathe a sigh of relief following efforts by the state government to ensure safety of lives with the introduction of new jetties and response centre. This official say will not only help to ease traffic on Lagos roads, but also go a long way to encourage those who use this means of transportation to have safe sail. Lynn Leneke has more. Great luck on Lagos roads is a major challenge. And so, many Lagosians have turned to water transportation to enable them access their businesses and workplace on time. To ensure those who use this means of transportation are safe, the Lagos State Government has introduced various measures to ease transportation in the metropolis. These four new operational jetties are part of such initiative. The jetties comprise 10 rescued boats to be manned by response officials and channeled in various locations around the waterways. We're trying to create that enabling environment to ensure that these investments thrive and these investments are sustainable. So having this safety system will further give passengers that confidence that let me go on the water with in case of any emergency, I know that within a few minutes they will be rescued to, um, that will get to me. The location includes Leki, Ikorodu, Ijaguegba and Ilaje Bariga. The Director General Lagos State Emergency Management Agency described the positive step by the Lagos State Government as a new dawn for Lagosians, assuring those who use this means of transportation a safe trip. To ensure that we respond to any form of emergency or disaster on our waterways effectively and efficiently. The Lagos State Emergency Management Agency has over the years contributed positively to rescue operations of lives and property during disasters and has promised not to relent in their efforts as safety of lives and property is their priority. In Lagos, Lynn Lenake, NTA News. That's it from here. It's now back to Hawa in Abuja for more on Nationwide. And you know... Moving on, the fight against drug abuse in Nigeria has consistently raised attention, especially among the youth who often fall victim. To further strengthen sensitization and public awareness on the abuse of drugs, the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency, NDLEA, has unveiled its anti-drug ambassador for an effective response. Ruth Aguele completes the report. Mm -hmm. Kills them, but it persists. 
an addiction only the victims can explain, but a future that society will need to fix. In its efforts to redefine drug control and nab culprits, the agency taxed with the responsibility are not relenting in ending the menace of drug abuse in the country. One of its strategies is getting the youths involved. And Ugochi Onoha, who is 26 years old and a student of Lagos State University, today is unveiled as the anti-drug ambassador of the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Geared with these tools, Ugochi seemed ready for her mission. I plan to use my music to reach out to a lot of people out there because I feel like music can relate to a lot of people even more than words, especially young people out there that are so sink in drug and they need young people like me to give them advice, to talk to them. And she has the courage to be a very good representative of the NDL in their campaign to sanitize the society about drug use. I like to see a family that is not being affected. I like to see a street where this does not go on, such that as she talks and passes her message in Nigeria, more people will be aware of where we're headed. As the campaign continues, the NDLEA believes that saying no to drug abuse is a collective responsibility. In Abuja, Ruth Aguela, NT News. And Ibadan is next on Nationwide, where Lamre will bring us up to speed with news from that zone. Good afternoon to you, Lamre. Brian Mangu said the agency Ibadan. will ensure that looted funds are The acting chairman, economic Ibrahim Magu has reaffirmed the agency's commitment to bring looters to book through effective collaborations within and outside the country. The anti graft chairman made this while on a walking visit to the office of the commission in Ibadan. Kemi Oshin has the The EFCC chairman who was taking round the president of the EFCC noted that ensuring the state of the government the building is part of efforts to ensure the agency delivers on its mandate, making particular reference to some high-profile cases of financial appropriation by public office holders. Ibrahim Magu said the agency will ensure that looted funds are recovered to discourage criminal activities such as fraud and misuse of public among others. He commended the recent effort by the agency in checkmating the activity Internet fraudsters, popularly known as Yahoo Boys, adding that there can be no hiding place for them. What we do is that we have to put our head together to do something to update them. There are small boys who are very intelligent. They can be useful. So we can a way to build them. Um, fortunately, we cannot continue with our Ibadan Network Center due to unsteady pictures from that zone. The absence of optimal drainage system system and the indiscriminate attitude of people in refuse disposal continue to put communities at risk of flooding. Guests on NTA program Good Morning Nigeria said that this position while discussing the 2020 seasonal rainfall prediction by NIMET. Murjana to Adam Said has that. For some time now, NAMED rainfall predictions have been receiving greater attention due to past experiences of flooding in almost all parts of the country. Nigeria is said to play a big role in Africa in food sufficiency and even providing food to its neighbors. But the devastating flood makes it mandatory for all stakeholders to sit up. So to this extent, we will call on all states and all local governments, and everybody, every stakeholder, every Nigerian to wake up. This is a clarion call for there to be action to mitigate whatever effects will come af I mean, after flooding or late rains or early rains or too much rains or things like that. Uh, with now, with uh, SRP, uh, will now commence our coordination role as far as disaster management uh, is concerned. A uh, technical meeting will be held with all stakeholders, Ministry of Agriculture, 
municipal health because whenever there is flood, there is health consequences. The NIMED prediction has also affected the, the fire incident where he is talking about uh, dry spells. Yes, that's right. Definitely there is going to be fire and the fire during the spell can affect the little that is even undergoing drought in the farm, in the farmland. So we have to use all the, all the agencies together to ensure that we steady the report and then bring all the stakeholders together. The guests say the commitment of the federal government through proper information management and effective enforcement of the 2020 flood prediction is key in addressing all the challenges. So what we are now hoping for is to start having state governors that when they come, they come with pragmatic programs of actions that will ensure effective utilization of this very vital information. The release of water from Cameroon is said to be responsible for last year's flood in Nigeria. With NEMED and hydrological services prediction, Nigeria only needs better preparation to tackle the challenges this year in case it occurred. In Abuja, Murajanatu, Adam Said, NTA News. The Discrimination Against Persons with Disability Rights signed into law by President Muhammad Buhari last year is yet to be implemented. Worried by the non-implementation of the RAT, members of the Association of Lawyers with Disability in Nigeria visited the Director General of the NTA, Yakubu Ibn Muhammad, to solicit NTA support and partnership in giving effect to the provisions of the RAT by creating awareness. Vera Chingoba has more. The President of Lawyers Living with Disabilities, Mr. Daniel Owe, is appealing to the federal government to establish a national commission for people living with disability to fast track the implementation of the act. Mr. Owe said the visit is in commemoration of the fourth anniversary of the enactment of the act and to solicit the support of the NTA in creating awareness on the need for corporate entities and individuals to give effect to the provisions of the act to make life more meaningful to beneficiaries. He thanked the NTA for its partnership, noting that the implementation of the act would stem discrimination and give them a sense of belonging. We also need a Nigerian populace to know that persons with disabilities should not be discriminated. And uh, employers, employers in the public sector should also, in line with the provision of the Act, employ persons with disabilities whom before now have actually uh, suffered discrimination at the workplace. So we want the NTA to indeed create awareness on this Act. The acting director of news, Halima Musa, who received the lawyers on behalf of the director general of the NTA, Yakubu Ibn Mohammed, said apart from promoting the welfare of all Nigerians, NTA has already taken steps to comply with the act in terms of employment and provision of facilities to enhance performance of duties. She said the NTA will continue to join hands with other stakeholders to promote the enforcement of the rights and other obligations under the act. Under the Act, corporate offenders risk a fine of 1 million naira, while individuals are liable to pay 100,000 naira. There is also a penalty of six years jail term for the offense as an option. In Abuja, Viera Chumba, NTA News. Nura is in Saukutum with more stories on Nationwide. Hello, Nura. and welcome to Sokoto. Ahead of the rural elections scheduled for 25th January 2020 in Sokoto State, the Independent National Electoral Commission Sokoto Office is to work closely with anti-graft agencies to check votes buying and other forms of money politics. This was made known at the Stakeholders Forum for the Supplementary and Rural Election in Sokoto State. Show Muhammad Dati completes the story. Meeting through participants from the security and the grabs agencies, media, CSOs, and political parties in the state. It was a forum where stakeholders were updated on the forthcoming rerun and supplementary elections in the state. Available data from the yeah, INEC indicates that in four elections are to be own. conducted Mom, come 25th January 2020. Agents. Two federal constituency elections in Sokot South, Sokot North, and East Sawambuni federal constituencies. Others are state assembly elections 
in Sokoto Lost 2 and Binji local government areas. We are urging you to please in the name of Almighty Allah to play the game by the rule. Involvement of the two anti graft agencies, EFCC and ICPC, was to checkmate vote buying and other forms of money politics, while other security agencies are expected to perform their constitutional responsibilities. We, the security agencies, we are going to provide security for everybody. We hope that all the things said will be actioned, they will be done. But concerning what had been discussed during the meeting, we are 100% sure that uh, the election, the Rowan election, will be a very successful one. Other stakeholders are admitting a lot of observations and suggestions on how to conduct a hedge free supplementary Rowan election in the state. In Sokoto, Show Muhammad Detti, NTA News. Chairman Senate Committee on Defense, Senator Ali Magateka Dawamako, has urged supporters of all progressives Congress in Sokoto State not to be demoralized by the recent verdict of the Supreme Court, but be united and face every challenge squarely. He was speaking while addressing the crowd that welcomed him and his entourage in Sokoto. Muhammad Nasir reports. Hundreds of APC supporters thronged the Sultan Abakar Bassad International Airport to welcome home their political hero and his higher powered entourage. The senator was returning from Abuja after the Supreme Court judgment, where APC gubernatorial candidate and Sokoto State Hama Aliyu challenged the re election of the incumbent governor. The APC supporters come out en masse to renew their love and solidarity to Senator Aliyu Magataka Dawamoko, the APC gubernatorial candidate Ahmed Aliyu, and APC as a party. Addressing the crowd, Senator Ali Wamoko appreciated the immense show of love by people of Sokoto State and joined them to accept the Supreme Court verdict and tighten their belt to make the party more formidable. He called on people of Sokoto State to massively vote for the APC candidate in the supplementary election selected for Saturday. Minister of Police Affairs Muhammad Megare Dengadi was also full of praises to APC supporters for their continuous support to the party's leadership in the state and being in higher spirit despite the Supreme Court verdict. The APC gubernatorial candidate in the state, Ahmad Aliyu, thanked the people of Sokoto State for their fervent prayers to him in Sokoto, Muhammad Nasir, NTA News. And that's a contribution from Sokoto Nationwide continues in Abuja, Utawa. Thank you, Nura. Service chiefs and heads of security agencies have converged on Abuja to develop a unified template that will enhance synergy amongst the various state actors in the quest to secure the nation. Defense correspondent Ismail Musa reports that the Ministry of Defense provided the platform through a two-day interagency workshop. Insurgency in Northeast Nigeria, banditry in the Northwest, pipeline vandalism and piracy in the Niger Delta region are among emerging crime that has killed and displaced thousands of people with property worth millions destroyed. To stem these social vices, capable of truncating the nation's socioeconomic development, the military and other security agencies have deployed different strategies and platforms to prosecute these threats. I'm aware that one of the objectives of this workshop is to identify synergy gaps among defense and security agencies. Undoubtedly, such gaps exist and have manifested in various forms. However, we must be reminded that all of us here are responsible to the government. The task before this workshop is to enhance synergy among security agencies, prompt sharing of intelligence, and to define their individual roles to avoid duplication and ensure success in the ongoing drive to secure Nigeria and Nigerians. We have strong reason to advocate for inter-service, uh, inter-agency cooperation among our security agencies. The dynamics and nature of contemporary security challenges have become complex and varied, such that no single security agency can deal with the variety of threats Alone. The event is focusing on interagency synergy and imperative for defense and security management. In Abuja, Ismail Musa, NTN News.
and still on security, in line with the saying that security is everyone's business, the National Institute for Legislative and Democratic Studies is seeking collaboration with the Nigerian Army in the areas of research development to win the fight against insurgency and other security threats in the country. Kenneth Nanim reports that the Director General of the Institute was received at the Defence Headquarters in Abuja by Chief of Civil Military Relations on behalf of the Chief of the Army Staff. The National Institute for Legislative and Democratic Studies needs steps away from its primary mandate of capacity building for legislators and their aides to seek partnership that affects the security of all with the Nigerian army through research and other technical assistance. Only a world does not rely on the military hardware alone. We have to put so many variables into consideration. So we believe our institutes are aware with that in terms of capacities, in terms of the manpower, in terms of the resources, even in terms of the archives. Our institutes is out to last with your research institute, I mean to the research department. Appreciating the visit, Chief of Civil Military Affairs of the Nigerian Army, Major General Usman Sheikh Mohammed urged needs to step up action in educating lawmakers more on statecraft and information management on security concerns. We have a human rights desk where we entertain complaints and we have created a channel whereby we interact with people. We have our armed forces radio every Wednesday. We have a military, civil military relations hour whereby people phone in and they relate with us and if there are complaints they let us know and we investigate and uh, get back to them. Both parties underscore the need for the country to strengthen its institutions for national development. In Abuja, Kenneth Nanim, NTA News. An Army Degree Network Center is where we go now. Good afternoon, Abubakar. It's your turn. Good afternoon to you, Hawa, and thanks for joining us in Meduguri. The National Commission for Refugees, Migrants, and Internally Displaced Persons has provided relief support to hundreds of new arrivals to two IDP camps in Meduguri, the Borno State Capital. The distribution of the food and non-food items formed part of engagement in the state by the Federal Commissioner Bashir Garba Mohammed. Here is Mohammed Ibrahim with more details of the story. New arrivals to the NYC orientation and the Lerouan IDP camps, numbering about 600, were the beneficiaries of the gesture by the National Commission for Refugees, Migrants and Internet Displaced Persons. The Federal Commissioner Senator Bashir Garba Mohammed, who was touched by the plight of persons affected by the displacement, interacted freely with them to identify their needs and give assurances of subsequent interventions. Senator Bashir Garba had inaugurated an ICT business center at Waziri Ibrahim House, donated to the commission, which had trained 45 youths on computer literacy and will all be engaged in the venture. Focal person for no state social investment, Aisha Umar, who donated the center, and the executive chairperson, Sema Yabao Kolo, recommended the Refugees and Migrants Commission for initiating the viable venture in addition to sustained support to the state. While at the Government House in Meduguri, the Federal Commissioner disclosed efforts by the Commission in supporting IDP's established self-sustaining businesses and plans with partners to establish a resettlement centre in Borno. We are happy to also announce that some of the displaced persons we trained have now established businesses. We are extremely proud of their progress as newly established entrepreneurs and we intend to commission some of the main business centers on this visit and also explore other sustainable solutions for all displaced persons within the state. Governor Babagana Omar Zulum had pledged commitment to work with the commission as part of efforts to resettle communities displaced by the decade-long insurgency. In Meduguri, Mohammed Ibrahim, NCA News. Borno State Governor Professor Babagana Umar Azulum has paid a visit to headquarters of the multinational Joint Task Force in Jamaina, capital of Chad Republic. Mohammed Guni reports that commander of the multinational Joint Task Force, Major General Ibrahim Manu Yusuf, received the governor and his entourage. Governor Babagana Umar and the MNJTF commander held a close door meeting over the fight against Boko Haram in Faso Borno State, details of which were held for security reason. At an opening session, however, General Yusuf expressed on behalf of all member countries in the task force 
The encouragement by Governor Zulum's visit, which he said demonstrates his commitment to peace building in Nigeria and other affected countries. Professor Babagana Omara thanked the forces for their sacrifices and patriotism, assuring them of his support at all times. We went there and, 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 and appreciated the effort of the government of Chad towards supporting our internally displaced persons who are residing in the LCBC member states. Had a very good meeting with the MNJTF and also the LCBC headquarters in Jamaina. While in Jamaina, the governor's entourage proceeded to the headquarters of the Lake Chad Basin Commission, where you are received by the executive secretary of the commission, Ambassador Muhammad Nuhu, and other officials from different countries. A high-level meeting was held, which focused on security around the shores of the Lake Chad, humanitarian needs and restoration of the means of livelihood, as well as issues of transborder trade and direct road linkage between Nigeria and Chad. At the end of the meeting, leaders strengthened commitment to regional stabilization through sustained fight against Boko Haram and the stimulation of transborder trade. In Maiduguri, Mahmoud. And that's a contribution from Maiduguri. There will be more stories with Hawa in Abuja after this break. Get the latest news and updates from across Nigeria on NTA Nationwide. NTA Nationwide, weekdays by 4 p.m. Get it first, get it fresh. Thanks for rejoining us. Sports now. The African nation's qualifying draw for Qatar 2022 has continued to elicit reactions from soccer-loving Nigerians. Ayode Jimakinde is standing by live at the Moshud Abiola National Stadium, Abuja, to speak to this. Good afternoon to you, Ayo. Good afternoon, Howard. Good to see you again. Oh. Could you explain the difference in structure between the current qualifying draws and previous ones? Oh, no. Ayo, what's new about this new structure? All right, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah, the new structure that we've seen, um, it's most likely going to allow many of these other African countries who on a normal day would not have the chance of facing the big teams on the continent. It's to allow the so-called underdogs to have a fuel, try their luck. Possibly it could be their day. Uh, it's completely different from what we've seen in years past when um, teams are drawn in a knockout phase over two legs and then they, they proceed over different rounds to qualify for the World Cup. But this time around we're seeing 40 teams drawn in 10 different groups where the group winners, 10 of them will now go into a two-legged knockout to decide the five representatives that will be going to Qatar 2022. We seem to have uh, the Central African Republic, Liberia and Cape Verde in this group. Should we have any cause for concern? Is Nigeria safe? Well, to be really modest, uh, I think uh, we should be worried a little bit considering what um, Nigeria went through in the year 2005 when we were shocked by Angola and Nigeria could not qualify. Uh, the group looked relatively easy in 2005 also with um, uh, we had Rwanda, Algeria, Zimbabwe in the group, but Nigeria uh, had to lose out to Angola. This time around, the teams are not in any way near Nigeria when it comes to the strengths and the type of football that we play. But there is also the need to be very, very careful when approaching these teams that even the technical advice of the Super Eagles has come out to describe as very tricky. Okay, talking about um, having been very, very careful, do we have any promising African debutant team currently on our radar? Well... There are many of them out there. If you consider Chipolopolo of Zambia, for instance, they've tried to qualify for the World Cup a massive 14 times, and they've not been able to qualify. Now, in our group, we have um, Liberia uh, that has attempted to qualify for 10 times. They will really fancy their chances. Cape Verde has attempted it seven times. They also believe they can do it this time around, while the Central African Republic has tried three different times, but they still cannot qualify. Now, it's going to be very, very interesting to see how Nigeria will be able to pick points of these teams before going into the final phase of qualification. 
Thank you, Ayo. And um, moving on, fans tip Super Eagles to progress in World Cup qualifiers. Details and more with Kenne Emagwa-Dike.